and welcome and hello so this is my video on bolos this one is a general description a small primer on the bolo universe in which I will be discussing in the next two videos and a brief description of what bolos are so with that the first thing we're gonna look at is um, I'm gonna be reading off the bolo universe Wikipedia page here because it contains the most concise descriptions of uh, what I wish to describe all right, so the basic theme of this is it takes place in the future to the far future, um, usually around the 37th to 40th century, I believe, um, and with one story being in the 118th century, but that's it's an outlier. Um, the overall plot of this uh, features mostly military themes, includes space exploration, alien races, and advances in human society. Now, the grand portion of these novels are told from the story of the commander of the tanks the bolos and their artificial intelligences which they control the bolos with or ai all right we've got uh, basic starter bolos like uh, nike which uh, in the story miles to go is a it's a very tragic story and uh, tugs at my heartstrings a little bit and then you've got um Stories of the final battle of the Melconians versus the humans of the Concordiat, which I will be doing a little bit of reading of uh, at the end of this video. Um, the reading is quite long. It is about 24 minutes in total. Um, feel free to skip over it if you want um, and uh, read through the stories yourself, or you could listen to me uh, talk about it. And um, if you want to sit around and uh, listen to me uh, read you some stories, by all means. And if you'd like to hear me read you more stories in the future, leave a description in the comments. Uh, don't forget to smash that like and subscribe button, and uh, let's carry on with this. Okay, so the very basics here is um, Bolos are a autonomous armored fighting vehicles of immense size and godlike power. All right, early versions range in a few hundred tons based on basic principles of armored vehicles we have nowadays, rail guns, with a few special MacGuffins like Durachrome and Dura Alloy armor. And these range from a few hundred tons, I believe the um, Bolo 1, Mark 1 through 3s are about uh, 1 to 300 tons. And then you've got the Mark 33 Bolo, which was the final standard model appearing in the series, weighing in at 32,000 tons. Their AIs uh, were originally very uh, simple, but bloodthirsty, right down to the uh, well-articulate and missing link models of, again, Nike, uh, which I believe is a Mark 23 experimental bolo. And then we've got the fully autonomous, bloodthirsty, brutal, fully sapient uh, AIs of the Mark 33s like Shiva. So, they um, generally obey their human commanders. Um, they uh, have protocols in place just in case the Bolos decide to go rogue and uh, turn against their creators. So they have what's called the Resartus Protocol, which basically wipes out the entire AI core of a machine if it disobeys a human direction. Now, their offensive systems range from everything from the main system, which is called the Hellbore Gun, which is essentially a uh, deuterium-initiated fusion pulse cannon ranging in the megaton per second range. So each blast does megatons of damage per second. All right, and then we've got... Um, Several other secondary systems. We've got uh, VLS missile silos, self-breach uh, breach loading automatic mortars, um, infinite repeater cannons, which uh, range from uh, railgun flechette guns, which can manufacture ammunition from local resources on the fly, or um, ion pulse cannons. Uh, very similar to the fact that they don't have a traditional ammo, so they can technically fire infinitely hence infinite repeater they've got uh, larger rail guns uh, smaller hellbore guns uh, basically these things are little mountains of steel covered in weaponry and in the mind's eye they are an absolute majesty 
to be to see to behold and if you can just imagine the fights that rage in this universe in your head you would be left astounded so the defensive systems of the bolo units are range everything from your basic armor up to uh, various science fiction armors as durachrome, flint steel, dura alloy, and durachrome, and uh, a blade of ceramic armor. They've also got battle screens with uh, power capture abilities which can funnel energy weapons from your enemies, funnel them into the batteries, and then use that energy to fast charge their weapons and return fire on the enemy. Um, some units are equipped with electronic counter warfare and faster than light uh, communications. They've also got uh, counter gravity units, can remain submerged underwater for extreme extended periods of time, uh, are capable of uh, landing from orbit using their counter grab systems. But uh, ultimately, um, Again, they're just absolute god machines. Um, now, the last uh, thing it says here is the last resort bolos may detonate the reactors to destroy an enemy or prevent capture. There are several stories where this happens, actually, um, especially with the often not very well talked about Mark 34 bolos, which have an additional weapon called the Hell Rail, which is a mix of a deuterium pulse plasma cannon with a rail gun and this thing is designed to knock uh, capital ships out of orbit but uh, aimed at the ground it does absolutely tremendous levels of damage so with that uh, that's a basic overview of the defensive systems so now we will talk about the protagonists and antagonists of the series so the protagonists obviously are our bolos our heroes and their commanders the concordiate of man which is uh, Analogous, I guess you would say, to, well, um, the Federation of Planets, but pretty much strictly human-oriented. There's only three or four known Xeno allies of the Concordiat in the series, and they don't often make an appearance because, well, they're secondary to the actual... Um, secondary to the actual members of the story. The Bolos, their, en their true arch-enemies, and the commanders. So... The Bolos are uh, mecha anthropomorphic machines, uh, obviously governed by AI and human commanders. Those are our protagonists, our heroes, and they are awesome. I was a tanker in the military myself, so I have a natural affinity and soft spot for this in my life. Now, the first major, um, I guess you'd say, arch enemy of the. Uh, Concordia would be the Deng, which are dog-sized spider aliens, which uh, utilize uh, multi-petted walker, similar-sized uh, tanks, but not nearly as advanced as uh, the Concordia. Now, granted, the Concordia in this series is OP as fuck, but it's their series, so they get to be. It doesn't take from the fact that. Uh, Sometimes humanity does lose battles in this, and it is actually kind of really nice to see how they overcome these odds. Now, the major, major arch enemy of the uh, Bolo series are the Malconians, or Dog Boys. They're roughly human sized anthropomorphic canids, bipedal dog like humanoids, psychologically very similar to humans of the Concordiate. They control a massive empire, long military history, estimated to be around the size of twice the Concordia at its height. Well, they were not nearly as technologically advanced as the Concordia. They made up for it with numbers in droves. Ultimately, the Malconians were rendered theoretically extinct at the end of the Bolo series, but um, certain stories do indicate that there are small pockets of colonies of Malconians, and in some cases, even cooperating with human survivors. So, that uh, gives you an idea of sort of the depth of these stories. Now, with all of that out of the way, and you've got a basic primer of uh, what our bolos are, and uh, the enemies they face... Um, let's uh, do a little bit of reading so you can get an indication of uh, the level of violence that these weapons are capable of dealing out. Like, the Mark 1s to Mark 10s are generally, you know, heavy armor supports, 
whereas you've got the Mark 32s and 33s, which are considered continental or planetary siege engines, and a single one is quite capable of burning entire planets to ash. So, with that, let's uh, do a little bit of reading, shall we? This is from Bolo's Book 4, Last Stand, created by Keith Laumer. This is a compendium or of uh, short stories of Bolo's, the artificially aware uh, tanks from the future, and this is the prologue and chapter one from A Time to Kill by David Weber. I feel this best illustrates the uh, levels that the uh, humans and the, your, their machines will go to. So without further ado, here's the prologue from A Time to Kill. It was called Case Ragnarok, and it was insane. Yet, in a time when madness had a galaxy by the throat, it was also inevitable. It began pl as a planning study over a century earlier, when no one really believed there would ever be a war at all, and perhaps the crowning irony of the final war was the study undertaken to demonstrate the lunatic consequences of an unthinkable strategy became the foundation for putting that strategy into effect. The admirals and generals who initially undertook it were actually intended to prove that the stakes were too high and the Melkonian Empire would never dare risk a fight to the finish with the Concordiat, or vice versa, for they knew it was madness to even consider. But the civilians saw it as an analysis of an option and demanded full implementation once a study a full implementation study once open war had begun, and the warriors provided it. It was their job to do so, of course, and in fairness to them, they protested the order at first. Yet they were no more proof against the madness than the civilians when the time came. And perhaps it was fitting, for the entire war was a colossal mistake. The confluence of misjudgments on a, con on a cosmic scale. Perhaps if there had been more contact between the Concordia and the Empire, it never would have happened. But the Empire slammed down its non-intercourse non edict within six standard months of first contact. From a human viewpoint, that was a hostile act. For the Empire, it was standard operating procedure. No more than simple prudence to curtail contacts until this new interstellar power was evaluated. Some of the Concordia xenologists understood that and tried to convince their superiors of it, but the diplomats insisted on pressing for normalization of relations. It was their job to open new markets, to negotiate military and political and economic treaties, and they resented the Melkonian silence and the no transit zones along the Melkonian border. The Melkonian refusal to take them seriously as they took themselves. They grew more strident, not less. When the Empire resisted all efforts to overturn the non-intercourse edict, and the Emperor's advisors misread that stridency as a fear response, the insistence of a weaker power on dialogue because it knew of its own weakness. Imperial intelligence should have told them differently, but shaping analyses to suit the views of one's superiors was not purely a human trait. And even if it hadn't been, the intelligence analysts found it difficult to believe how far human technology outclassed Melkonian. The evidence was there, especially in the Dinochrome Brigade's combat record. But they refused to accept that evidence. Instead, it was reported as disinformation, a cunning attempt to deceive the Imperial General Staff into believing the Concordia was more powerful than it truly was, and hence more evidence that humanity feared the Empire. And humanity should have feared Melkon. It was human hubris, as much as Melkonian, that led to disaster for both the Concordiat and the Empire, which had traditions of victory. Both had lost battles, but neither had ever lost a war. And deep inside, neither believed it could. Worse, the Concordiat's intelligence organs knew the Melkon couldn't match its technology, and that made them arrogant. By any rational computation of the odds, the human edge in hardware should have been decisive, assuming the Concordia had gotten its sums right. The non-intercourse edict had succeeded in at least one of its objectives, however, and the Empire was more than twice as large as the Concordia believed, with over four times the navy. So the two sides slid into the abyss, slowly at first, one reversible step at a time, but with ever-gathering speed. The admirals and generals saw it coming and warned their masters that all their plans and calculations were based on assumptions which could not be confirmed. Yet, even as they issued their warning, they did not truly believe it themselves, for how could so many years of spying, so many decades of analysis, so many computer centuries of simulations all be in error? 
The ancient data processing cliché about garbage in was forgotten even by those who continued to pay it lip service. And the Concordiat and Empire alike approached the final decisions with fatal confidence in their massive, painstaking, and painfully honest and totally wrong analyses. No one ever knew for certain who actually fired the first shots in the trellis system. Losses in the ensuing engagement were heavy on both sides, and each navy reported to its superiors honestly so far as it knew that the other had attacked it, and not that it mattered in the end. All that mattered was the first shot was fired, and the t both sides suddenly discovered the terrible magnitude of their errors. The Concordia crushed the Empire's frontier fleets with contemptuous ease, only to discover they'd only been frontier fleets. Light forces deployed to screen the true ponderous might of the Imperial Navy and Empire. Shocked by the actual superiority of humanity's war machines, they panicked. The Emperor himself decreed that his navy must seek an immediate and crushing victory, hammering the enemy into submission at any cost and by any means necessary, including terror tactics. Nor was the Empire alone in its panic, for the sudden real revelation of the Imperial Navy's size, coupled with the all-or-nothing tactics it adopted from the outset, sparked with the same desperation within the Concordiat leadership. And so what might have been nothing more than a border incident became something more dreadful than the galaxy ever imagined. The Concordiat had never produced enough of its superior out weapons to defeat Melkon outright, but it produced more than enough to prevent the Empire from defeating it. And if the Concordiat's deep strikes prevented the Empire from mobilizing its full reserves against human, human held worlds, it couldn't stop the Malconian Navy from achieving numerical superiority sufficient to offset its individual technological inferiorities. War raged across the late centuries, and every clash worse than the last, as the two mightiest militaries in galactic history lunged at one another, certain the other was the aggressor, and each conceived its only options were victory or annihilation. The door to madness was opened by desperation, and the planning study known as Case Ragnarok converted into something very different. It may be the Melkonians had conducted a similar study, and certainly th their operations had suggested they had, but no one will ever know for the Melkonian records, if any, no longer exist. Yet the human records do, and they permit no self-deception. Operation Ragnarok was launched only after the Melkonian demonstration strike on New Vermont that killed every one of its planet's billion inhabitants. But it was deliberately planned strategy, which had been developed at at least 12 standard years earlier, and it began at the orders of the Concordiat Senate and ended with 30 plus standard years later, under the orders of God know what fragments of local authority. There are few records of Ragnarok's final battles because in many cases, there were no survivors on either side. The ghastly mistakes of diplomats who misrode their own importance and their adversaries' will to fight, of the intelligence analysts who underestimated their adversaries' ability to fight, and the emperors and presidents who ultimately sought simple resolutions to their problems might have bred the final war, but it was always the soldiers who finished it. And But then, it was always the soldiers who ended wars and fought them and died in them, and slaughtered their way through them, and desperately tried to survive them. And the final war was no different, no different in, from that in any other in that respect. And yet it was different in one way. This time, the soldiers didn't simply finish the war. This time, the war finished them as well. Kenneth R. Clearly, PhD, from Introduction of the Operation Ragnarok, Into the Abyss, Cerberus Books, Ararat. Year 4056. Chapter 1. Death came to the planet Eshark on the 98th year of the final war and the 32nd year of Operation Ragnarok. It came aboard the surviving ships of the 43 Corps of the Republic, which had once been the 43 Corps of the Star Union and before that the 43 Corps of the Confederacy, which had once been the Concordiat of Man, but whatever the government name, the ships were the same, and for there was no one left to build new ones, and there was no one left to build anything. For the Malconian Empire and its allies, the Concordiat and its allies had murdered one another. Admiral Evelyn Trevor commanded the 33, 43's escort from her heavy cruiser flagship. Trevor had been a lieutenant commander when the 43 Corps had set out, and the escort had been headed less by no less than 10 Terra-class Super Dreadnoughts, 8 Victory-class carriers, but those days were gone. Now the RNS Mikuma led her consorts. 
into the blazing run against Ishark spaceborne defenders and the ragged remnants of three Malconian task forces which had rallied there, because Ishark was the only planet left to defend. They outnumbered Trevor's ships by four to one, but it was a hodgepodge force, and what Trevor commanded lost in tonnage, it gained in experience and savagery. Ishark was the last world on its list, and it came behind a, behind a cloud of decoys better than anything the defenders had. There was no tomorrow for either commander, and even if they could have one, they might have turned their backs upon it. The Mel human and Malconian races had hurt one another too savagely. The blood hunger possessed them both, and neither side's calm officers would raise a, raise a single friendly planet. The humans had nowhere to return to even if they had lived, and the Malconians were defending their last inhabited world. Even the f warship's AIs were caught up in the bloodlust. The fleets lunged at one another, neither worried about preserving itself, seeking only to destroy the other, and both succeeded. The last human fleet di units died, but only three Malconian destroyers survived to attack the 43, and they perished without scoring a single hit when the Bolo transports intercepted them. Those transports were slow and ungainly by fleet standards, but they each carried Mark 33 Bolos on their docking racks. Each one of those Bolos mounted the equivalent of a Repulse class battlecruiser's main battery weapons, and they used them to clear the way for the rest of the ships, which had once lifted four divisions of mechanized infantry and two of manned armor, 800 assault shuttles, 1500 trans-atmospheric fighters, 16,000 air cab mounts, and the 82nd Bolo Brigade from a world which was now so much rubble. Now the remaining transports carried less than 12,000 humans, a single composite brigade of each infantry and manned armor, and 200 aircraft of all type, and seven bolos. That was all, but it was sufficient. There were few flicks, fixed planetary defenses because no sane pre-war strategist would have ever considered Eshark a vital target. It was a world of farmers in a position of absolutely no strategic importance and the sort of planet which routinely surrendered, trusting the diplomats to determine its fate when the shooting ended. But no one in the 43 requested a surrender, and no one on Eshark's surface was offering one. This wasn't that sort of war. One or two batteries got lucky, but despite 43's previous losses, it retained more than enough transports to disperse its remaining personnel widely. Only 600 more humans died as the ships swept down to their LZs to disgorge the cargo. And then, Eshark's continents burned. There was no finesse, for the combatants had lost their capacity for finesse. The days of kinetic bombardment platforms and surgical strikes on military targets were long gone. There were no platforms, and no one was interested in any surgery any longer. The only option was brute force and the merciless imperatives of Operation Ragnarok and its Malconian equivalent, and the humans and Malconians screamed their rage and agony and hate as they fought and killed and died. On Eshark, it was Malconian troopers who fought desperate, with desperate gallantry to preserve their civilians, as it had been the humans who fought to save their children and their civilians on Trevor's world, and Indra, and Matterhorn. And as the humans had failed there, the Malconians failed here. Team Shiva always had point for Alpha Force. Team Shiva always had the point, because it was the best there was. Bolo 33D 1097 Sierra Hotel Victor was the last Bolo built by Bolo Prime on the moon known as Luna before the Melconian world burner blotted Terra and Luna away forever. And no one else in 43 Corps could match his experience, except perhaps his human commander. Newly enlisted Private Diego Harigata had been 16 year old when Terra died. Now Major Harigata was 49 with 32 years of combat experience. All of them had been aboard the Bolo whose call sign was Shiva. And man and machine had fought their way across half a hundred planets. It was one of the many ironies of the final war. The Bolo deployment concept had come full circle. Mark 33 Bolos were designed for independent deployment, but they were almost never actually deployed that way. For the direct neural interfacing first introduced aboard the Mark 32, and then perfected and last most powerful of the Concordiat's Bolos made them even more deadly than their cybernetic ancestors. They were no longer simply artificial intelligences built by humans. Rather, a Mark 33 was an AI fused with a human in a partnership that produced something the designs are Designers had neither predicted nor expected. The human Bolo fusion fought with Bolo precision and total recall, communicated with his fellows in the total systems data sharing net with Bolo clarity,
and analyzed data and devised tactics with Bolo's speed and executed them with Bolo cunning. But it fought with human ferocity. The Dinochrome Brigade's earlier psychotronic designers had always feared to build the savagery which looked behind the human forebrain's veneer of civilization into their huge, self-aware war machines. They had feared the elemental drive, the ferocity which turned a hairless, clawless, fangless biped into the most deadly predator of a planet, for their own history taught the human lessons of what could happen when human warriors went over the edge. But it was available to the Mark 33, and for it was each part of part of each team's human component and Team Shiva called upon it now. There were 19 bolos in the 82nd Brigade when the 43 was assigned to Operation Ragnarok. There should have been 24, but the days of full-strength units had long passed even by then. 41 slaughtered worlds later, and there were 7, split between the 43's 3 LZs. Team Shiva led the attack out of LZ-1 against Alpha Continent, the largest and most heavily populated and defended of Eshark's three land masses. The Malconian were waiting, and General Sharth Nag Naryama had hoarded men and munitions for years to meet this day. He had lost units administratively and lied on readiness reports as units fighting on the ground towards Eshark, understating his strength when other planetary COs sent out frantic calls for reinforcements. General Sharth had guessed the Imperial Navy would fail to stop the humans short of Eshark, and that's why he stockpiled every weapon he could lay his hands on, praying that operations before Eshark would be enough to weaken the 43 enough for him to stop it. But he never expected to defeat it. He only hoped to take it with them in a mutual suicide pact, while there was still someone alive in this world to rebuild after the wreckage had cooled. It was the only realistic strategy open to him, but it was, wasn't enough. Not against Team Shiva and the horrible experienced world killers of 43. Following excerpt is told from the perspective of the AI 331097 Sierra Hotel Victor. We move down the valley with wary caution. The duality of our own awareness sweeps the terrain before us through our sensors, and we seldom think of our components' parts any longer. We are not a bolo named Shiva and a human named Harigata. We are a team Shiva, destroyer of worlds. We embrace the ferocity of our function as we explode out of the LZ. 32,000 tons of alloy and armor and weapons riding on our counter-grab at 500 kilometers per hour to hook around the enemy flank through the mountains. Team Harpy and Team John lead the other prong of our advance, but their attack is secondary. It is our job to lead the true breakout, and we land in our tracks, killing our counter-grab and bringing up our battle screen as the first enemy Fenris-class heavies appear in our sensors. There are more of them than projected, but they roar up out of the very ground and vomit missiles and plasma at us. An entire battalion attacks from the ridgeline at 025 degrees, while the remainder of its regiment rumbles out of the deep subterranean hides at an arc from 227 to 351 degrees, and passive sensors detect the emissions of additional units approaching from directly ahead. A precise count is impossible. But our minimum estimate is that we face a reinforced heavy brigade, and cert class mediums and eagle class scout cars simultaneously sweep out of the dead ground to our rear right and attack across the broad front, seeking to engage our supporting infantry. The force balance is unfavorable, and retreat is impossible, but we are confident in the quality of our supports. We can trust them to cover our rear, and we hammer straight into the enemy's teeth tanks as they deploy. Hell comes to E-Shark as we forge ahead, and we exult at its coming. We bring with us, we feel it orgiastic releases, our missile launch, missile hatches open and fire blasts away. We turn one zero degrees to port, opening our field of fire, and our main battery turrets traverse smoothly. Two, three, two hundred centimeter hellbores, each cycling on 4.15 seconds, sweep the Fenner's battalion which skylined itself on the northeasterly ridge and hunger and terrible joy feel us as the explosions race down the enemy line. We taste the bloodlust, the rapid fire hammering of our mortars and howitzers as we pound the certs and eagles on our flanks, and we send our hate screaming from our hellbores. Our battle screens flame under us answering missiles and shells, and particle beams rip and gouge at us, heating our armor to white-hot incandescence, but bolos are designed to survive such fire. Our conversion fields trapped energy, channeling it to feed our own systems as we rejoice as that stolen power vomits back from our own weapons. 
The Fenris is less than half our size. And two, two point five seconds of main battery fire reduced 15 units of the 1st enemy battalion to smoking rubble. Yet two of its vehicles score upon us before they die. Pain sensors scream as their lighter plasma bolts burn through our battle screen, but they strike on an oblique, and our s armor s is sufficient to turn them. Molten tears of dura alloy weep down our flank as we turn upon our dead foes' consorts, but we only feel the joy, the hunger to smash and destroy in the crucible of combat. We forget the despair, the knowledge of ultimate disaster which oppresses us between the battles. There is no memory now of the silence over the comnets, the awareness of the worlds of which once with a concordiat lie dead or dying behind us. Now there is purpose, vengeance, ferocity. Our destruction of our foes cries out to us, giving us once again reason to be, a function to fill, an enemy to hate. More enemy heavies long last long enough to drive their plasma bolts through our battle screen, and suicide teams pound away with plasma lances from point-blank range, yet he cannot stop us. A Fenris fires from 4.61 kilometers and disables number 3 and number 4 hellbores on our lateral port battery before itself dies. A dug-in plasma team, which has concealed itself so well that we approach within 1.44 kilometers before we detect it, gets off a single shot that blows through our track shield to destroy two bogeys from our outboard forward track system and five cert class mediums lunge out of a narrow defile at range of only 3.20 kilometers. The ravine walls hide them from our sensors until they actually engage, and their 50 centimeter plasma cannon tear and crater 40.6 meters of our starboard flank armor before we blow them to all to ruin. Even as the last cert dies, enemy missiles and shells deluge everything that moves. The inferno grinds implacably forward, and we are not man a machine, we are the man machine, smashing into the enemy's defenses and turning a mountain valleys into smoking wasteland. Our supporting elements crumple or fall back crippled, and part of us knows still more of our human comrades have died, will die, and are dying shrieking in agony of the emulation of plasma. Yet it means no more to us than the deep glowing wounds in our own flanks, and we refuse, refuse to halt or turn aside for which we cannot have, we will extend to no others. All that remains of the human and Malconian alike is the long dark, and all that remains to us is the will to fight and kill and maim until our own dark comes down upon us. We feel the death of Team Harper. Bolo 33D2075 HRP Hotel Romeo Papa and Captain Jessica Adams but even in the anguish of their loss, we know the enemy's very success spells his own destructed. He has been deceived, decoyed, into concentrating a full two-thirds of his firepower against our diversion. So we rejoice at the enemy's error and redouble our efforts. We shatter the final line of his main position in an orgy of point-blank fire, and the steady coughing of our own anti-personnel clusters. Railguns light rake the light enemy AFVs trying to withdraw support personnel, and the remnants of our own manned armor and infantry follow through our breakthrough. We pivot, coming to a heading 358 true, and rumble through the smoke and dust and the stench of burning enemy flesh, and Team John appears to port, advancing once more in line with us as we heave up over the final ridge. Sporadic artillery and missile fire greets us, but it is all the enemy has left. Recon drones and satellites pick up additional heavy units rushing toward us from the east, but they are 7, 8.59 or minutes away. For now, there is only the wreckage of the defenses we have already crushed, boiling in confusion in the river valley down below as the light combat vehicles of infantry and shattered air cav squadrons seek to rally and stand. But it is too late for them to stand. For beyond them, we see the city. Intelligent Estimates estimates its population at over just 2 million. We confer with Team John over the TSDS net. Fire plan generation consumes 2.661 seconds. Then our main batteries go into rapid, sustained fire mode, and 78 megaton range plasma bolts vomit from our white hot tubes each minute. Despite our target size, we require only 7.651 seconds to reduce it to an overlapping pattern of firestorms, and then we advance down the ridge to clean up the enemy's remnants. 
the enemy vehicles stop retreating. There's no longer an objective in whose defense to rally. They turn upon us. They are mosquitoes assailing titans. Yet they engage us with every weapon as we grind through them with Team John on our flank. And we welcome their hate, for we know its cause. We know we have hurt them, and we savor their desperation and despair as we trample them under our tracks and shatter them with our fire. But one column of transports does not charge the attack. It is running away, instead hugging the low ground along the river from which flowed through the city we have destroyed, and its flight draws our attention. We strike it with a fuel air bombardment which destroys half of a dozen transports, and we understand as we see the Malconian females and pups fleeing from the shattered wreckage. They are not combatants, but as Operation Ragnarok is not about combatants. And even as we continue to smash the attacking enemy vehicles, we bring our railguns to bear upon the transport. Hypervelocity flechettes scream through mothers and their young, impacts exploding in sprays of blood and tissue. And then our howitzers deluge the area in a cluster of munitions that lay a carpet of thunder and horror across them. We note the extermination of the designated hostiles, and we refer our full, return our full attention to the final elimination of the military personnel who failed to save them. Alpha Force's initial attack and the destruction of the city of Halknaka were decisive, for Sharth Naryama's HQ and family were in Halnakath, and he refused to abandon them. He died with the city, and Melkonian coordination broke down with his death. The defenders' response had become more disjointed, but no less determined. But without the organization, which might have let them succeed, they could and continued to kill their attackers and grind away their strength, but they could not prevent the 43 Corps from completing its mission. It didn't happen quickly. Even with modern weapons, it took time to murder a planet, and battles raged for weeks, forests burned to ash, and Bolos and Fenris class armored units raged the flame to hurl thunder at one another. Cities blazed. Towns disappeared, and in the lightning flash of mashed hellboard bombardment, farmland became a smoking desert. Frantic transmissions from the LZ hammer into our receivers as, enemy, as the enemy counterattack sweeps upon our, on it, and we turn an answer, rising recklessly on our counter-grav. Power generation is insufficient to support free flight and maintain our battle screen, which strips away our primary defense against projectile and particle weapons, but that is a risk we must accept. The enemy has massed his entire remaining strength for this attack, and we hear the screams of dying humans over the calm circuits as we run our desperate race to return the meat. It is the race we lose. We land on our tracks once more 10.25 kilometers from the LZ, bringing up our battle screen, and we charge over the intervening ridge. But there are no more screams over the calm circuits. There's only silence, and the rising pall of smoke, and the riddled wreckage of transports, and the last three Fenris-class heavies of E-Shark, waiting in ambush. Madness. Madness upon all of us in that moment, for none of us knew we were the last. We have no supports, no reinforcements, no place to go. There are only four sentient machines and a single human. The last human on E-Shark, perhaps the last human in the entire galaxy. On our own, and filled with the need to kill. We are the crowning achievement of twice a thousand years of history and technology, of sophisticated weapons and tactical doctrine. And none of us care. We are the final warriors of the final war, smashing and tearing at one another the frenzy of hatred and despair, seeking only to know that our enemies die before we do. And Team Shiva wins. Two of them we blow into ruin, but even as we fire the shot that disembowels the third, his last plasma bolt impacts our glacius, and agony crashes through our brutally overloaded pain receptors. Massive armor tears like tissue, and we feel the failure of internal disruptor shields. The bright, terrible burst of light as plasma breaches our personality center. In our last fleeting incident of awareness, we know death has come for us at last. There is no more sorrow, no more hate, no more desperation. There is only darkness beyond the terrible light, and peace at last. Stillness has come to Eshark, not at a mercy, for there was none, no mercy to be had here. No chivalry, no respect between warriors. There was only the madness and slaughter and the mutual destruction until there was no one left to fight. No defenders, no attackers, no civilians. 43 Corps never left Eshark, for there was no one left to leave. And no Melkonian division ever added the Battle of Eshark to its battle honors, for there was no one to tell the ghosts of Melkon it had been fought. There was only silence and smoke 
and the charred holes of combat machines, which had once had the firepower of gods. And no one ever reported to the public that the very last battle of Operation Ragnarok had been a total success. Okay, so that was our video on the Bolo universe, including a reading of the prologue and chapter one of A Time to Kill, a story of the final war between the Concordiat of Man and the Malconian Empire. Stay tuned for the next video, which will be a look at A Road to Damascus, a Bolo novel, a standalone of uh, the Bolo universe, where we will look at it through the lens of today's current society, where collectivism versus individualism, uh, the rural versus urban divide, and some comparisons and lessons to be learned and gleaned from the lens of science fiction, which allows us to explore our worlds around us through different lenses, different views of point, and uh, hopefully that uh, we can get a better understanding of what's happening around us by using our imaginations and using the written word. So with that, I uh, hope you guys have a good day and uh, enjoy yourselves. Zero out.